Well, good morning. Great to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? The 21st division of John's Gospel. John chapter 21 is where we are going today, and we need you to open your Bible there. We're going to read some verses together that will not be on the screen. So if you'll grab a Bible and uh, be opening there, that will help you as we make our way through the material this morning. And while you're doing that, we welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. Hope you have had a uh, wonderful week past and hope the week that lies ahead will be great for you as well. Glad that we can start off the week by being together, <clears throat> being together this morning. Those of you who are visiting with us via live stream today, we welcome you as well. Thanks for being with us and being a part of our church family today. And we hope that all the things that we do will help all of us as we study together this morning. It's good to see some folks making their way back to our assembly that have been, that have been out for a long time because of special circumstances that they have in their life with their health and then the COVID pandemic that is going on. And we have more and more, it seems like every week, that are now kind of making their way back to us. In particular, this morning, I'm glad to have the Delmans back with us. Now, Jim and... Uh, uh, Big Jim had been back with us and Brenda once or twice before, but then a lot of those health things settled in and we're glad that they're able to be out today. Yeah, I want to say something. Those of you who are <clears throat> kind of long time uh, folks in Tampa Bay, there are a couple of names that you'll recognize from their association with the school down the street. A lot of you will recognize the name of Don and Jean Cannavello and uh, the Cannavellos were there for years and years and years and uh, uh, Jean fell uh, and passed away from that. And so we know that some of you will remember them and know them, and we want you to <clears throat> be aware of that this morning. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, we look in our church family and we see a lot of folks that uh, good things have come uh, over the course of the pandemic. Some very difficult things have come their way. And then we get good news, like we did this week about uh, Christy McCormick and about the uh, turn for the better that she took this week. And uh, we thank God for that and pray that that will continue, continue to be the case. We got another update last night about Christy, and uh, she continues in a good direction. And we're very, very thankful for that. And we pray that that will continue. All right. Well, let's get down to the business at hand <clears throat> this morning uh, in, the minutes, in the minutes that we have. I would imagine that probably several of you perhaps have seen or perhaps read the book that you see on the screen. Crucial Conserva Conversations has sold just over 4 million copies. It's a, it's a book that's influenced businesses <clears throat> and churches and families and individuals because it deals with a very important issue. It, it deals with effectively having conversations that nobody really wants to have. Conversations that once you have them can go very, very well or they can go very, very badly. They're conversations like the boss with an employee who really doesn't have much of a work ethic at all. Or by the other, by, on the other hand, the employee trying to talk to a boss who's been abusive to them in some way. Or maybe it's the elder in the church who's talking to somebody who's determined that they're going to do wrong instead of doing right. Or maybe it's the parent talking to a teenager who has definitely crossed a line and in attitude about that is defiant with them. And so those conversations are extraordinarily challenging. Sometimes it's husbands and wives. Husbands and wives who have to have that difficult conversation. Marjorie Kellogg wrote about families and said that there was a husband and wife who lived together for so many years that they mistook arguments for conversations. Can you imagine that? That'd be a terrible way to live, wouldn't it? I read this week, I read this week about a husband and wife who were having an argument and the wife said to her husband, when you die, when you die, I am going to dance on your grave. And the next day, the husband went out and made arrangements to be buried at sea. Think about that one for a minute. <clears throat> yeah, some of you are going to get that on the way home today. Well, those are crucial conversations. They are difficult conversations. When it comes to the New Testament, the epitome of uncomfortable, difficult conversations occurred between Jesus Christ and the Apostle Peter. Now, they had several of those, as you are well aware. And so there is an occasion when Jesus declares that he is going to be crucified, and Peter confidently, boldly says to Jesus, you are wrong about that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. That was a tough conversation that day. In the garden, Peter takes out his sword, and he is willing, in an act of great courage, he is willing to die for his Lord. And yet Jesus says to him, Peter, put the sword away. That's not what we're about, not what we're going to do. 
right here. But the quintessential example is in the final page of John's gospel after the resurrection and just before the ascension. Now, John 21 makes it clear that this is the third time that Jesus has appeared to the disciples. So they've seen it before. Now, this is a special circumstance, and that circumstance really isn't our lesson, so we'll not go into that. You're good Bible students. You know, you know that <clears throat> what happens here basically is that from this episode, there come two very crucial conversations between Jesus and the apostle Peter. Now, one of those conversations was about loyalty. When Jesus says, do you love me? And in fact, he said that three times. And that was the number of times that Peter denied him. And so that makes logical sense. It's very symmetrical in, it, in, the, in its own way. And three times, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, you're good Bible students, and you've heard in Bible classes and sermons that the English language doesn't always do justice to the word love. And so the first two times, the first two times that Jesus says, do you love me? He uses the word agape or agapeo. And we understand that. That's the word in John three sixteen that God so loved the world. And you know that that is an unconditional one directional love that is a matter of choice and not feeling. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me that way? And both times Peter responds by using the word phileo, which is, I have tremendous affection for you. You are my friend. That's the way I see you. And the third time Jesus uses that word with Peter. And I think sometimes we just kind of rush past that. But I think what Jesus is, is saying to Peter is, you know what, Peter, I love you too in that way. I have that affection for you as well. I feel that way about you also. So that was a question about loyalty. And each of those times, Jesus says, Peter, I want you to, <clears throat> I want you to shepherd my sheep. I want you to lead and feed and protect my people. And that's what Peter would do for the rest of his life. Now, the second conversation was about the future. It was about the future. And I want us to read in our Bibles a little bit here. You have your Bible open? Look at verse number 18 with me. So the conversation continues. And Jesus says to Peter, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you. And they will lead you where you do not want to go. Now, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. So that's a prophecy about Peter's future and how he's going to die. You are going to stretch out your hands, just like you would stretch out your hands for somebody today in the 21st century to put handcuffs on you. He was going to be bound and they will bring you to a place where you do not want to be. Now, we think that Peter was probably crucified after the fashion of Jesus. And so this is a prophecy about his death and his death. Jesus says, he says, what a great vote of confidence. Peter, I know you're going to hang in there and do the right thing and stay loyal to me. And your death is going to glorify, glorify God. He basically tells him how he's going to die. Would you want to know how you're going to die? I'm not sure about that. I've thought about that with this. Would you want to know how you're going to die? I would want to know only if it is that I'm going to die when I'm really, really old and I'm in perfectly good health, even though I'm old and I'm in my own house, in my own bed and surrounded by my family and they're singing hymns and I can hear the angel wings fluttering. That's the only one I want to know about. If I'm driving on the Pacific Coast Highway in California and go over the Bixby Bridge and am plummeting to my death, I just so not know about that. But Peter, he knows. He knows what's going to happen to him. And so Jesus says, this is what will happen. And he says, follow me. Now that's interesting because he said, Peter, I want you to follow me. It's going to be tough. You're going to be arrested. You're going to die at the hands of another, but I want you to follow me. But that's not the end of the story. So read with me beginning in verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And this was the one who would lean back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Now that's interesting. 
Because in verse 22, he says, look, that's really none of your business. I want you to take care of you. I want you to follow me. Uh, the contemporary English Bible phrases that, what difference does that make to you? Follow me. Philip's paraphrase of the Bible says, is that your business? You follow me. Now, I want you to think about that because that's, the, that's where we're going to <clears throat> work from today. Where Jesus just says, look, John is a whole other matter. And if I decide that I want him to live until I come again, really that doesn't alter anything for you. So don't be obsessed about what's going to happen to John. You take care of your own business and you follow me. I think that's a great question. What is that to you? And it's a great commission for us individually. Follow me. It's a great question and a great commission. And I want to use that to talk about two questions this morning that I think sometimes, sometimes as Christians, whether we're brand new baby Christians just learning to stand and walk or whether we're, whether we're really seasoned saints, I think there are two questions that sometimes we ask when Jesus, I think, would probably say the same thing. Well, you know what? That's probably not what you need to be concerned about. You just follow me. So let's talk about those two and you tell me if that, that isn't correct. Here's the first. Here's the first. Why should I struggle while others are blessed? I think that's a question a lot of folks ask at some point in time. Probably everybody asks that at some point in time. Why should we struggle? I struggle while others are blessed. Now, the answer to that, by the way, is because you're a person of faith. And that really has two parts to it. The first is because you're a person, because you're a human being. And so Jesus said in the mountain message, the rain falls, God's rain falls on the just and on the unjust. Peter would say, the same sufferings that you're enduring are endured and suffered by all your brotherhood in the world. And so the first answer is, look, you're going to struggle like everybody else. You're not a special case. Nobody gets out of this world unscathed. It just doesn't work that way. And so the first answer is because you're a person. But as a Christian, the second answer in that is, you're a person of faith. And so why should I struggle when others are blessed? Almost every Christian at some point in time has circumstances come in their life that they look at and they say, you know what? This doesn't seem right and doesn't seem fair. And you look at others, you look at people that don't honor God, don't think anything about God. They defy God, rebel against God. And they seem to be living a Teflon coated life where nothing bad ever happens to them. And we look at that and we say, you know what? That's not right. So why should I hang in there? Why should I struggle? Why should I retain my faith and struggle when, <clears throat> when others seem to be so very blessed? Well, the answer is because you're a person of faith. Now, I want, to, I want to leave John's gospel for a minute, and I want to take you to the book of James. Because the book of James, in my estimation, deals with that very question. And it deals with it in every single chapter of the book. In many ways, James is a primer on the subject. Because James knows that when faith is really tried, faith really does work. In fact, one of the major themes in the little book of James is that there is a very practical way to tell whether or not we are living our faith when life is tough or if we're just mouthing words on Sunday. And so in every chapter, he talks about that. And I just kind of want to walk you through that. We're not going to take a lot of time, obviously. We can't do that this morning. But let me just walk you through James' answer to this question. Why struggle when others are blessed? Well, he's going to, he's going to give an answer in every chapter. So let's just take a look at that as, as we go through it. In chapter 1, he says, you know what? Faith is proven by the way you deal, by the way you deal with your trials. Faith is proven by the way you deal with your trials. Dealing with difficulties, James would say, is not an elective in the life of a Christian. It is a required course. And so his book begins with these words. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And you, how, many, how many thousands of times have you heard that? That James doesn't say if, he says when. And that's an accurate observation, by the way. And so he says, look, this is, this is a required course for every Christian. You're going to have some difficulties. You're going to have some trials. And James says that trials put your faith on trial so that your family, your coworkers, your friends, they all find out whether Christian is just a name you wear 
or if it in fact is the person that you are. When suffering comes, James argues that Christians have a little different perspective about that. Because a Christian looks at that and says, you know what? If I can get through this with my faith intact, I'm going to come out on the better side and be a better person. And that's what he said in verse 4 of chapter 1. Let patience or endurance do its job, do its perfect work, and it will make you mature and complete and lacking in nothing. I read years ago a quote that said that Christians believe when they're in the fire that God's hand is on the thermostat. Now that sounds kind of trite, but there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Because what did James say about our faith? He said, God will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we were able to bear. And so that's chapter one. In chapter two, he said, faith is proven by the way you treat all people. Well, why would that matter? Well, because when we're in trials, when life is difficult, when it's hard, <clears throat> when circumstances are rough, it's easy to become self-focused in the way that we deal with others and maybe to go and deal with them with prejudice or maybe arrogance. Why? Well, because when things are tough, we want someone to blame that surely this isn't my fault. Surely I didn't put myself in this position. And so we look for someone else to blame. And so how do we treat others when times are tough? How do you treat somebody of a different race or of a different nation or just for that matter, a different region of our country? Maybe you've heard the illustration, the true story of Gandhi when he was a college student in South Africa, that he had read the New Testament in its entirety and he was impressed with Jesus. And he decided to attend a Christian church. But when he went to attend on Sunday, a church that said it was following Jesus, he was told, you can't come in this church. There's a church for people of your color somewhere else. Go find it. And Gandhi said, quote, I decided then and there that if there, if there was a caste system in Christianity too, I may as well stay a Hindu. Well, of course, what we know is that that was never, never the way God designed that to be at all. In fact, James said in chapter two, my brethren, don't, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality. Can't do that. Cannot do that. Can't have a, a racial uh, discrimination or national discrimination or even within the bounds of America, a regional discrimination. We just can't do that. And in fact, he would say in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you will, you will love your neighbors, you love yourself. And he said, when you do that, <clears throat> you do well. So faith is proven even in difficult circumstances by the way we treat others. And then third, by the way that we control our tongue. Now, you know that in James chapter 3, you've got, the, you've got the greatest treaties in all the New Testament about a Christian and their use of words. We take, we take just two verses out of that long section there in verses 9 and 10, where James says, look, you know, sometimes with our tongues, with our mouth, we bless God and we curse others. And he said, that should never happen. That just should never, ever happen. And yet, we all know that hard times can sometimes produce very harsh words. Now, I guarantee you, if you're honest, I will guarantee you, if you're honest, you can think of a point in time when you were having a bad day, or you were having a bad month, or you were having a bad year, and you said something either to your mate or a coworker or your kids. Or maybe you took it out on a server in a restaurant or your, and you can fill in the blank there because it was just a difficult, hard time. Let me ask you a question, ladies. Have you ever heard somebody, <clears throat> have you ever heard somebody absolutely shatter their Christian facade because they opened their mouth and spoke? James says that should never happen. And faith is proven in chapter four of the book by the way we contain our pride. Why is that a problem? You know why pride's a problem? Pride's a problem when things are difficult and we're being squeezed because everybody, we're, we're all trying to park in the same space. When you, go, when you go to the mall at Christmas time 
and you're, and you're circling, you know, for the 20th time, and you're just trying to find one parking space. That's all you want. Just, just one, one space, one space. And <clears throat> somebody, you see, you see the taillights come on. What, what happens? Everybody in the world wants that one space. Everybody wants that one, that one space. I remember when I was in Italy one time, I was in the car with uh, Johnny Berdini and his wife, Pina, and Pina was driving and we were, we were trying to find a space in Italy. That's impossible. And she kept saying, die, 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 die. And I thought, well, that's kind of harsh. And then I learned that in Italian, that means give, which you give a space, give me a space. But uh, probably most of us at Christmas in the mall have thought, die, die, die. We just, we just, we just want a space. But you, you know what? Nobody, nobody in this room got a memo this morning that today is all about you. It doesn't work that way. And so James in James 4, verses 1 through 11, he goes through a long litany of talk about that. And remember now that the, that the book began in James 1 and verse 2 by saying, look, I know you're in difficult circumstances. I know you're enduring trials. This is a tough time. But when he gets to chapter 4 in the first 11 verses, the the capstone of that really was in verse 10 when he said, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And James lived that. In fact, James in this book will identify himself as James, slave of God, servant of Christ. And what he's saying in that is, and you and I know that he's going to die a martyr's death, that even then as the brother of Jesus, he doesn't expect to be exempt from difficulties. And so he doesn't allow pride to get in the way and make him think, look, because I'm Jesus' brother, I should have special circumstances. He just doesn't do that. And so faith is proven by the way we contain our pride. And finally, by the way we continue in prayer. The way we continue in prayer. You see, faith really has to go to work <clears throat> when you get a not yet from God. You know, sometimes you pray to God and God says yes. And it's pretty clear that he's answered in the infirmity. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes God says, not yet, not, not just yet. That's a tough answer. Now, James got that because some of the favorite words that he uses in this book are words like patience and endurance and maturity. You know the difference between an adult and a child? There, there are a lot. <clears throat> but but a, a child doesn't understand the words not yet, right? A child when you say not yet, they think that means no. But an adult, when you say not yet, we understand through time and experience that not yet really means, well, hang in there, uh, keep contributing, keep working, keep going, and maybe something's going to good will come from this. When James is ending the book that began by saying, look, I, I know you're in tough times. He ends it by saying, I, I want you to be patient. He said, it's, he said, the, the day's coming, Lord's going to come and he's going to balance all the scales. <clears throat> and he said, it's kind of like a farmer. Plant seed, but doesn't go out the next day and try to harvest. And then he'll use in James 5, two illustrations. One is Job, who went through extraordinarily difficult circumstances that he didn't really understand at all. And yet he retained his integrity and he never let go of God or his faith. And the other is Elijah who spends three and a half years by a brook praying for circumstances to change. And James says, be like those two guys. Be like those two men. What is that? It's saying that faith is proven by the way that you continue to pray. And so why should I struggle while others are blessed? Well, because you're a person, you're a human being, that's just going to come into your life. But more than that, because you're a person of faith. Now, that's really what I want to talk about this morning. I said there was a second question, but I'm, it's just going to take me a minute to talk about it. Here's the second question. And that is, why should I hang in when others bail out? Why should I hang in when others bail out? Now, that's a good question as well. And I think that's a question the Christians sometimes ask. Sometimes we ask, you know, sometimes people bail out on their faith. Why should I hang in? And the answer to that, by the way, is because you're a person of consistency, of consistency. I want you to listen carefully to me for just a couple of more minutes, and then we'll be finished this morning. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say very, very carefully. Declaration of faith is easy. The easiest thing you'll ever do is declare your faith. The demonstration of your faith is another matter 
entirely. I know that's true because James says that the demons have an impeccable, impressive theology. He said the demons believe that there is one God. Their theology is right about that. But he said the crucial question that we have to ask is this. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith alone save him? And the point of that is that faith should work. Faith should show itself genuine and authentic and real. Again, declaration of faith is easy. Demonstration of faith is another matter. Sometimes people think that others don't see them. But we do see. Everybody sees. I, sometimes we, we look at people, Christians, sadly. Sometimes we look at Christians. And it, it breaks our heart to see what we see. Sometimes we begin to see some of those telltale classic signs. That passion is just fading. Uh, sometimes you see that by, you know, by, by a lack of being here. A lack of being together. When they, when they could be with us and be together with us. Or sometimes it is people who are here, but they're not here while they're here. And you can tell, you can tell that as well. Or sometimes you see it in an, a change in attitude, an attitude adjustment, but the adjustment is going in the wrong direction. And you know that nothing good is going to come from that. Now I got to tell you, I think when we see that, it's so easy to be discouraged. And yet even in that, I think Jesus says, look, just like I said to Simon Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. You, you can't let that distract or discourage you. You follow me. It's interesting when Paul wrote to Timothy, he talked about that a lot. Timothy, I think, was challenged by this. I think Timothy was challenged by, you know, you, you read about Timothy and <clears throat> there was obviously some timidity about him and Paul had to address that. And I think one of the challenges he may have had was looking at people who had bailed out on their faith and thinking that maybe as, a, as an evangelist, as a minister, that he had failed them in some way. And so look at some of the contrasts that Paul will use when he writes to him. He said, these also resist the truth. They will progress no further. Their following may manifest. But you, you have carefully followed my doctrine. And it's almost like he's, he's having to build him up a little bit. He said, look, don't be discouraged by those who are resisting truth. And remember that you've been doing the right thing. And he pats him on the back for that, as it were. Here's, here's another place he does that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He, he says, you know, evildoers and imposters, they're going to they're go from bad to worse. And, and they'll deceive and they will be deceived. And that's horrible. It's terrible. Tragic. It's tragic that they put themselves in that circumstance. But then he says, but as for you, you know, what, what is that to you? Well, it is something to you because you care about them and you care about their soul and you want them to be okay. But he says, make sure that you remember, as for you, you continue. You keep doing what's right. And he reminds him, you, you've known the scripture since you were a child. And the, those scriptures make you wise to salvation and nothing's changed in the scripture. And so you keep doing what is right. You know, when you look at those together, clearly Paul is saying, look, don't, don't let the actions of others distract you or discourage you to the point of not, to use his language, not continuing to do what God expects us to do. What is that to you? Now, again, that is something to us. In this circumstance, this is something to us because we care about the souls of others. And it breaks our heart when we see individuals in that circumstance. And so we have to do what we can do where we where we can. And so Paul would say, listen, we, we encourage you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. And so it is something to us in that way. It does matter to us to the point that we've got to do what we can. But when all said and done, it's still, you, you follow me, regardless of what they do. Now, <clears throat> again, the quintessential example of that is it's just given in John chapter 6 because it's the best example because it's an expired example that the Holy Spirit preserved for us. And you, you, you'll recognize this. This is John 6, that circumstance where from that time many of his disciples went back and they no longer followed him. And Jesus said, look, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter, 
Isn't that interesting? It's Simon Peter who answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so many turned back and no longer followed him. And it's Simon Peter who steps up, the same man to whom Jesus would say, you follow me. And here's the point. Jesus says, I want you to follow me. Even if others will not, even if others think it's not necessary, you follow me even when the road is long and tiring and lonesome. And you follow me in truth and you follow me in compassion toward the souls of others. And you follow me in forgiving and in serving and in holiness. And regardless of what anybody else on planet earth does, you follow me. And when you do that, he says, you will be an example to others. Now, I want you to listen just one more second. And so just, just listen. Don't put your stuff away just yet. Just listen. And I want to read to you. You don't need to open here. When you do that, when you do what he said, follow me. When you do it in spite of what anybody else in this world does, here's the result. First Timothy 4, Paul wrote to Timothy, beginning in verse 12, and listen to what he says. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Now, I got to tell you, we have a wrong view about that. We, we think young and we think, we think teenagers. This is a Friday night teenage devotional verse. No, nah, Timothy, Timothy's probably, he's in his 30s here probably. He's talking to adults. He was a young adult, but he was an adult. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But as you, as for you, you set an example for the believers, for other Christians, in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Don't neglect your gift given to you through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Now listen carefully. You be diligent in everything. Give yourself wholly to this so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You follow me. Now, how about you this morning? You see that message of Jesus by the Sea of Galilee when he cooked breakfast for the disciples. And when he had that conversation as he walked along with Peter, it's still as valid today as it was that day. You follow me. And if that means this morning that you need to follow him in the waters of baptism, or if you need to come home to him today as his follower who's walked away, this invitation's for you. Let's stand. Let's sing.